Hi, David here. Welcome to Season 2 of Papa PhD. To kickstart the second season of interviews, I'm bringing you someone who's been helping researchers figure out their careers for a while now and who will be recounting how he navigated his transition and how he got to the position he's in today. But before we go into the interview, I want to quickly share with you what new features you'll be noticing starting today on Papa PhD. The first big change is that the interviews are now going to be shorter, around 40 minutes, and they'll be published as a single episode on Thursdays. Second, you'll see that I'll be spending more time discussing what my guests do today and what advice they have for you. And you'll see, the more we go into the interview, the more value you'll find. So be sure to stick around till the end. And finally, every episode, I will have a short section at the end where I'll be sharing trailers of podcasts I think you'll enjoy and that are friends of the show. I hope you enjoy the new format. So without further ado, here's episode one of the second season of Papa PhD. You know, typically in the UK, only like 50% of PhDs are still in academia three and a half years after they graduate. You know, some people are obviously doing research work still as postdocs. Some people are doing teaching and lecturing um, and some, some are in administrative positions. But yeah, half of all PhDs will be working outside of academia. You know, when you tell that to especially like first and second year PhDs, they can't believe it. It's like mind blowing. You know, even when I talk to people I meet and they I introduce myself, say I've got a PhD or something and they say, what, what, why aren't you working at Oxford or Cambridge? You know, you've got a PhD. That, that must be what you should have been doing. Welcome to Papa PhD with David Mendez, the podcast where we explore careers and life after grad school with guests who have walked the road less traveled and have unique stories to tell about how they made their place in a world of constantly evolving rules. Get ready to go off the beaten path and hop on for an exciting new episode of Papa PhD. So today on Papa PhD, I have with me Dr. Chris Humphrey. Chris Humphrey is a project manager and careers consultant and the founder of the popular careers website Jobs on Toast. He holds a BA in English Studies and an MA in Culture and Social Change, both from the University of Southampton. He completed his PhD in Medieval Studies at the University of York in 1997 and held a postdoctoral fellowship there until 2000. Since leaving academia, Chris has worked as a project and program manager in the private sector, specializing in technology, transport, financial services, and sustainability. Today, he works as a team leader and project manager for a leading European sustainable bank. Chris is passionate about helping people with their careers and personal development. He has given numerous career talks at universities in the UK, Ireland, Australia, and the US, and has taken part in live Q&A events on The Guardian's website and for jobs.ac.uk, amongst numerous other contributions. In 2012, Chris founded the website Jobs on Toast as a way to help master's students and doctoral graduates access the abundant career opportunities available outside of higher education. In our long conversation, Chris shared his academic journey all the way to the postdoc. In today's episode, I'm sharing with you what came after, how and why he started his career outside academia. Welcome to Papa PhD, Chris. Well, thank you, David, for inviting me and for having me on. I'm I'm really happy to to have you here, uh, especially given the the years of experience you have helping people uh, with masters and PhDs, like like I just mentioned, finding their path. Uh, and I, I think a word uh, that I think is really important is in the abundant number of career opportunities that are out there. I think this is one key thing that that people uh, are going to. Uh, well, people need to understand to kind of break this this feeling that they they may be failing uh, at life or at least at the, at their professional life if they uh, end up leaving academia after after graduate school. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, Chris, uh, to begin, uh, you you know you you've you're now working in the banking domain, which is very very different from uh, medieval studies. I don't think uh, you're you're wearing chain mails uh, at at work <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, but uh, 
maybe now let's go back to to uh, to the beginning of the story. This is part one of our interview, and we talk, we're going to talk more about what was your uh, academic uh, path, what journey uh, you know took took you into the domain you you studied, and end up uh, uh, working and getting your PhD in, and eventually even postdocing in. Yeah, like you said, uh, David, I did uh, I did my first first degree, and then I did a master's. Uh, degree, which was quite broad, really. I didn't have a kind of clear idea of what I wanted to do as a as a job or career, and I, I was very interested mm -hmm. in in kind of in cultural studies. You know, really looking at um, you know, look, looking at uh, things like uh, like like texts or uh, uh, or or theatre, that type of thing, but through a sort of historical kind of lens. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I really, after a while, sort of settled on this idea of, of studying the Middle Ages. Uh, and especially this sort of notion of um, of uh, festive life, and actually how mm -hmm. the extent to which uh, the sort of um, what people did in their in their own time in their in their leisure time um, was something not only for sort of celebration or pleasure, but also could be ways in which um, political views and ideas could be articulated. Um, and that's something mm -hmm. that really intrigued me: this sort of notion of of, of, of carnival. Um, and the world upside okay. down. So that's something that I decided to um, kind of specialize in. Um, and it sort of motivated me to go and do a PhD then uh, uh, at the University of York. So, um, yeah, that, that's when I went to the University of York in, uh, in, in 1993, where I, where, I, where I did my PhD. Mm -hmm. So the master's, uh, just because, again, I, I'm from, you know, I come from the, the biological sciences. Uh, how... You know, is that a, a traditional path, like doing a, a more of a broad master's and then, uh, you know, changing universities uh, to do your your PhD? Did, so, was was your your path in that at that time a traditional one? You'd say? Um, yeah, maybe maybe not, because I guess maybe quite a few of my peers maybe they already did a, a master's degree in medieval studies already, so maybe they already started okay. to specialize at a master's level, and I I didn't really have a clear, I hadn't really clearly settled on a kind of historical period to, to study. Um, I was more interested in sort of, uh, th you know, cr critical theory and, and cultural theory and kind of approaches to studying uh, culture and cultural mm -hmm. artifacts rather than necessarily sort of settling on a historical period as such. I was, I was still quite okay. broad. So you ended up after, at the end of your master's then, you, you were able to kind of focus and, and home in on, on this idea that you mentioned, which is actually interesting, uh, of the, the festive aspect, but the, the connection to maybe political, uh, uh, political reality, political critique, I imagine, also? Yeah, this is, this is it, because it's, um, you know, it's a common sort of theme that's used, not just to talk about the Middle Ages, but about later periods, too, that uh, this, this idea of the world upside down, um, but as mm -hmm. a safety valve, you know, it's sort of seen as something that, uh, you know, if, if people are permitted to blow off steam, to um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have fun and do things on a particular day of the year, then somehow this sort of dissipates all, any resentments or uh, frustrations they have and they sort of act compliant the rest of the year. And I just really d didn't sit well with me as a kind of, well, it, as, a, <laughs> as a way of thinking about... Um, you know, working people and ordinary people was a very patronizing kind of view. Um, and it didn't fit mm. also with historical evidence that I was aware of. And so I kind of really determined this is what I'm going to make is my, uh, you know, this is what my dissertation is going to be about. It's going to look at the historical evidence in England for this type of thing in the Middle Ages. You know, I'm really right about this kind of, this, this crossover um, and how popular, mm. um, polit uh, popular festivity could become sort of a vehicle for articulating political views, you know, in a period when there wasn't democracy or votes, uh, not, not at least yeah. for the majority <laughs> of people. Um, but nonetheless, people could, ex could um, uh, articulate a political viewpoint, especially in, in the context of local conflicts, not necessarily mm -hmm. national type of level, but at least um, use this kind of occasions and the imagery as associated with them to kind of, to kind of make a point. Mm. This is very interesting because, again, uh, coming com coming from the biological sciences, you know, we we start with an idea, with a, um, uh, a, a first project that that we want to work on, and a question we want to answer about cells, about uh, tissues, about uh, behavior, many things like that. Here, you were embarking on 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 a kind of a, a journey of 
going, I imagine, into you know uh, uh, libraries, archives, and f and finding uh, and, and making and kind of writing a story and, and a history in this in a way that hadn't been written yet about this particular question you just mentioned. Uh, can just f for the sake of the, the listeners out there, can you talk a little bit about um, you know at, at you know and going back to that time? How how it was to uh, did you have to move to your to to go to the University of York? It's it's just a question that came up. Uh, you had to move to 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 go to your PhD. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah I looked at some different universities to go, but uh, York, um, you know, it's uh, obviously is a, you know is a, a medieval city, um, and mm -hmm. so it had it has got a good archival collection, but also the mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. the Centre for Medi Medieval Studies at York is. Um, very well known, or still is, but at the time for interdisciplinary okay. type of work. And, you know, I was from an, a literary background, but always interested in the historical context of literature and not just seeing writing as kind of the product of a great mind by great writer, you know, but how <laughs> did that, how did it reflect what was happening in the historical period in which it was written, mm -hmm. the, the kind of context? Um, and so I really liked how York was set up that they didn't you didn't feel like you have to be like a medieval historian or a medieval linguist or a medieval um, okay. art historian or something. You could just kind of go and be a medievalist and then you can take, you mm -hmm. can kind of do more whatever you want. And that was, that really appealed to me because I don't, didn't really feel like I like to be compartmentalized. I like to just like, this is my question and I'm going to mm -hmm. um, take this question forward and answer it with, with whatever sources and resources that I can, that I can find. So yeah, I had to move to York. Um, but it was it was the right mm -hmm. place to go, both in terms of the archive that was available and also the, the supervision that I would get and that sort of scholarly community that, that supported mm -hmm. that, you know, my own sort of mindset and way of working. So it was a culture that, that you appreciated and that you thought was going to foster the the best to foster the work you wanted to do but so my question was so you had to move you uh you know a, a young a phd student moved to this to this new city uh and to start on this project uh how how uh, did you go about finding uh, your supervisor um at, at that time how was that process i'm just thinking uh for people out there considering a phd you know how was that process of okay deciding this is the city this is the university they they do it the way i I identify best with how was the experience for you of going you know moving and starting on this journey and finding your supervisor and then eventually you know uh, uh kicking off uh, the, the the actual project yeah i guess uh, during the course of my masters i was i talked to some um uh you know of the, of the lecturers and professors at southampton and you know they obviously gave me encouragement in the things i was interested in and said you know you could go on and make a phd out of this and so that was really where I looked mm -hmm. where could I where could or should I go and I could stay I could you know there's a comfort side of you that says oh you could just stay in the same place in Southampton you know um but you yep. also uh, <laughs> you know I knew that's not the best for the challenge and the project that I wanted to do so yeah I was I actually went to another uh, UK university where I was interviewed by um two uh, academics about doing the topic there they actually And I don't think this would happen now. Uh, but they said, you don't want to come here and do it. You want to go to York and do it. Uh, oh, yeah. Which was, uh, you know, <laughs> interesting. I, I'm very grateful to them for sort of redirecting me because I, you know, I was trying to find my own path, but they suggested to go to York. And so mm -hmm. that's where I applied and had, had an interview there. And they were, um, you know, very welcoming to, to me. I think really they'd only just started supervising PhDs in the Centre for Medieval Studies. So they taught a, a master's programme But they didn't. Have, okay. They and the, they within the departments. They they had PhDs on a single um, disciplinary sort of track, you know, like history or literature. But okay. they only had one other previous PhD who was this interdisciplinary PhD, and you came out with a PhD in medieval studies. So I think they were okay. kind of pleased that hey, we've got people who want to do this this thing, and that was a good fit for me because I didn't mm -hmm. want to feel pigeonholed. Um, so yeah, that was that was how it is. So I had an interview with them, and they made me an offer. And, um, yeah, then I went up and I moved my whole self up to, up to York to kind of, uh, start mm -hmm. over that new life. Um, and, um, yeah, it was good though because they had a good, they were very supportive. Um, they have a very good sort of induction program and, um, okay. there's a number of PhDs starting at the same time and also a master's program as well. So they kind of mixed everybody in together as, 
you know and so it was mm. it was good like that it didn't it wasn't like what you know you're just turning up by yourself here's the library you know see you in three <laughs> years type of thing <laughs> see you in five see you in three years <laughs> yeah it was it was really you know it was a very collegiate very like um yeah like it's like it's, you felt like you were joining a community and i think that was very like valuable to, to me you know and something that i really appreciated mm. Hmm. Excellent. I, I, it's it's interesting you mentioned community. I really uh, I'm gonna for sure get back to that a little bit later. But um, again, just out of curiosity, and and I imagine uh, a PhD in humanities, uh, the 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 way it works today must not have changed that much, even though things have evolved and and uh, technologies etc. But how you know? In, can you quickly go throughout through the three years? Uh, talking maybe of of you know what did you spend the first year doing second year third year you know prepare then preparing for the defense how that goes uh, in in a, in a humanities phd yeah i guess um it's been a sort of like a dual track in the first year where you're um you know you're getting to grips with the the primary sources as it were the actual uh you know medieval uh, records that you're looking at and so in my case i was looking at records mm -hmm. from english towns so in in, in the okay. middle ages they had Uh, town councils and they would write down uh the, literally the, like you know the minutes of things that happened within the town um and there's also other sorts of records that you can consult like um uh from more like ecclesiastical records you know from bishops or um uh monasteries and that type of thing so it was kind of like trying to acquaint myself with the primary sources um you know which which did I, which do i want to focus on i focused on actually records from four english towns um, and okay. at the same time, starting to work through some of that material. I was also looking at the secondary sources. So what's, what are the predominant approaches to thinking about um, popular culture and festivity in the Middle Ages? Um, you know, and to be honest, a lot of the stuff at the time is kind of quite patronizing of like, ah, oh, look at these funny medieval people. Um, it, it wasn't really sort of, um, it wasn't such serious, such serious, taking with such seriousness as like, hey, kings and queens or wars of the roses, or there's a lot of seriousness and things and emphasis given to the, um, you know, the, rightly so, but to the court and to the big affairs of state. And I was, from my point of view, it's more like a popular, popular history was what I was trying to write. And so it was also, yeah, trying to look at the, look at the secondary sources and read more widely and look at the main arguments and try and, you know, mm. come up with a sense of, challenge what is what is it was that i was trying to argue and trying to show um and so that's probably really what you spend your first year from even a year and a half doing really till you really get to the essence of what it is you're trying to mm -hmm. do and say and show um and then in in all of that how, how uh, what's the role of the supervisor how involved are, are they in this uh, in this part of the Because uh, I, I imagine, like you were said, like you said that um, you said that the, the kind of the, you didn't use the word onboarding, but the, the induction, induction, yeah. So they were good at bringing people and and getting into get, getting them into the institution and creating this community. But what about the with the supervisor supervisor uh, themselves? How how are how's their involvement in this first part of the of the process? Uh, yeah, usually you would sort of meet maybe three or four times a term and then you would just kind of like talk it through with them how how you were getting on what what about your you know what ideas you were having um what sort of challenges and then they would sort of steer and guide you and you know sometimes it was okay. quite positive um other, other times it was um you know more challenging you know and uh, uh you know where is you know where um Because it, it's it's difficult because you although I can as I speak about it now it all sounds very formed mm -hmm. like at the time yeah. and you know yourself <laughs> it 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 doesn't you know I can articulate it now in twenty or thirty words but then it was kind of lots of things going around in my head you know of like of course you know how how people are talking about this is not right how people are looking at this is not right what they should be doing is talking mm -hmm. in this language because of this and what about this example and it just all comes out as a kind of um, you know, as a, as a, as a sort of mask, it's all going around in your head and it's, yeah. it's, it's that sort of <laughs> shaping. And obviously I wasn't actually a historian by training. I was a literary scholar. So there was that aspect of trying to develop more of a historical style in my writing. So some of it's feedback on your writing. Um, 
Yeah, and some of it's just kind of like emotional type of support as well. I think mm. that you, you know, obviously you have periods when you're when you're down or you don't feel like you're making progress or other things are happening in your life. So yeah, it's a mixture of sort of you know scholarly and sort of pastoral mm. kind of care uh, for you. But mm-hmm. yeah, I always I always felt supported, um, and but I always I kind of felt challenged as well. Like it's not just that you can kind of coast along, you know, because they're also there to make sure you do complete you know and that you are making a contribution to the field mm-hmm. no for sure and and it and it's you, you are under their wing in a way as a, as a phd student and they for sure they need to make sure that whatever you produce is a uh, is up to uh, to the standards uh now you mentioned before uh that one of the things that you appreciated about uh, York when you arrived was community. Well, you said that um, somehow the way uh, uh, students were welcome, be it masters or PhDs, there was um, there, there was a, a community that was that was formed between them. Can you talk a little bit about that and about how that may have helped, maybe in these more difficult moments that that you mentioned uh, before? Yeah, I think um, they had a good setup because they had a sort of intake of masters students maybe about 30 or so and then they also had an intake of phd students maybe five, five or six or or, okay. or more yeah and i think everyone was kind of welcomed um in terms of the space that there was a center for medieval studies where the uh, professors and the lecturers had their offices um there was a, a common room where it was a common space where people could 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 go and sit and read or uh with a with a, a cafeteria next door um yeah and everyone was kind of encouraged to uh to 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 mix in and attend say like social events or also what happened is i i took some i joined in some of the classes with the um master students um okay. so like i said i was a little bit less um experienced on the historical side of things so i took i took some classes with the master students um and there were also some common classes as well which were like latin um there's things like okay. uh, like critical critical theory um so yeah there was so there was some of the some of the things were just anybody could could go along so it was it was good because it was um it wasn't really sort of hierarchical in that way everyone was just like united by their interest in this in this historical mm-hmm. period um and uh yeah just i think it was, they just did a really good job of sort of uh of forging that that commun- that sense of community and you you know you would naturally find people even though um you know, not everyone's doing the same thing. You would naturally find people who were of doing course. the same subject or that you just got on with socially. And so it was good. I, I soon sort mm-hmm. of formed a network of friends, um, probably more with the master's students actually than necessarily the PhDs. But that was, you mm-hmm. know, that's just personalities, I guess. Of course, of course. And j- just out of curiosity, w- uh, were there uh, any like clubs? Uh, and, and I'm looking for... Uh, were people getting together doing things that would be extracurricular uh, like it could be sports or other other things that uh, that you might have taken part in yeah i think um because of the sort of people that we were then people we used to kind of like go out on on trips so maybe on the weekend we just get together and drive go to a kind of ruined abbey or a, or a castle or something like that or mm. uh, um that kind of stuff but also yeah i mean at the university there's a lot of things going on and i was quite passionate about um uh facilities for graduates because i mean this is going back into the sort of mid 90s but universities were mm-hmm. at that time quite oriented towards towards bachelor's students and undergraduates you know mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. there was less provision for masters and phd students you, yeah you were you were saying that uh, the the universities were geared much towards uh, uh bachelor's uh, students and the facilities were were mostly geared towards them and you took interest in to, uh, in uh in facilities for the graduates how you know what form did that take how did was there a, 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 um, an association of students taking care of that how, what what was that exactly yeah there was like a graduate students association okay. Um, and so there was a kind of elected representative who would sort of, um, you know, spend some time trying to coordinate events for, for, for graduates, but it was also about spaces. So making sure there was like these, um, graduate common rooms as they called okay. them. So there was a space where graduates could go s- oh, separate from, um, undergraduates and, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting because you don't always want to sort of be separating everybody out. But on the other hand, you have sort of different interests, like yeah. age-wise and so, socially. 
and the different types of conversations that you ha- might have. You want to meet with your supervisors or meet with other people. So, you know, it was trying to sort of help the university to take this seriously because at the time it, it was like, oh, maybe we could close these rooms because nobody really goes to them, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and things. It was just, it was, so it was trying to stick up a little bit for, for, for graduates and make sure that our voice was heard and not, not, and not lost. And, um, yeah, something I've always had, I suppose, is sort of that, um, bit of that passion to sort of stand up for people and make sure that people are treated well, treated fairly, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, and are not, and, and are not sort of neglected or left to fend for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that, uh, especially, you know, working in an association that has a mission like that, you also establish like special, uh, rapport with the people that are in the same association with you. I don't know if you still keep uh, friendships from that time, but I'm sure that having this other, Uh, group at the time must have been interesting for you in terms of thinking uh, of other things and uh, and uh, getting your mind sometimes maybe getting your mind off the research per se <laughs> yeah i think i think that's it i think it's it's good to uh yeah do do other things and like i quite liked it because it was a different social circle so some of those people were like scientists or okay yeah. um you know they would already not be thinking about academic careers and talking about other things that they were going to do so yeah and um we did also There was a kind of um, I can't remember the name of it now, but actually a kind of a national, a national graduate association okay. uh, within the UK. So some representatives would go from the different universities to uh, meet up, and that was good. Yeah, I just really enjoyed that. So I sort of, uh, I mean, some people might think, oh, that's the last thing I would be want to do on my Saturday, you know. But <laughs> I just, uh, it, was, it was good. It's good socially, and it's just good to sort of advocate for people, yeah. you know, and yeah. um, try and push forward an, an agenda. And, and get a get a recognition for mm. um you know for the cl- for the kind of class or the kind of t- type of people that we were mm. make sure that we get the right voice in the university um we get the right facilities um and we you know our, our, our sort of contribution is heard and valued yeah so uh, now going back to 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 your journey uh, and just by the way I, i totally agree with you and i just had a conversation not long ago about the importance of if when and i i, I didn't and i uh, also i didn't have the time or i didn't know or didn't think i had the time but the importance of taking part in student associations uh for for many reasons uh this the, there's this uh, changing this meeting with people who do different things who are in different domains for sure there's the just the social aspect uh but also the networking aspect and you kind of alluded to that the seed of talking about different careers might have been uh, sown at that at that uh, time which is very interesting to me uh, mm. and it's not something you can predict when you you know when you embark in a, in a, in a mission like that <laughs> uh, but yeah. so <clears throat> the, where i was going now is you said a year one and a half you 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 finished kind of digging you know into into the whole uh, um, uh, um, into the There's a word that's now that's not that I'm uh, missing, but uh, you know, the, the, you know, you look, you went through the the, the archives, you yeah, digging through the archives, and and kind of found what material you thought was going to be your your uh, your prime, you know, your your raw. Uh, oh wow! Now I'm 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 looking for a word and it's not coming. Um, but your raw material for what was going to be your thesis. How mm-hmm. does the next year and a half go towards, uh, you know, thinking of, of writing up and then defending? How, how was how was that, and how was that like emotionally? Um, how how is how was that different from the first part of I, I arrive at York and I start digging and I find all these things and I discuss it with my supervisor. Now I need to start writing. Is that is that the next chapter? Is uh, starting to write up? Yeah, I think so. And I think that's one of the hardest points, actually, because you kind of like uh, you can keep kind of you can keep digging and accumulating for, forever. And it's kind of like that sort of maturity when you kind of think, OK, um, yeah, I've got, you you realize that you're not at the beginning and you're prob- you're in the middle or even you're past the middle. And then you're <laughs> looking you're more like, OK, now I'm looking towards the end. And yeah, I think for me, yeah, that was a kind of a challenging period to kind of conceptualize like the dis how is this how is all this stuff going to play out at a structured level because i had kind of some chapters that were more the kind of literature review uh yep. you know of the secondary sources and then some introductory type of material 
Um, but it's like, how is this really going to be built like in chapter by chapter? And I think that was, that did take some time, but I really came to this conclusion of doing of, of doing case studies okay. to actually really do like a deep dive into specific um, historical uh, cases that I'd found and like really do like a whole chapter where I would take this one incident, you know, and really analyze it, okay. look at the background of the incident, the incident itself, the, the impacts and implications of these things. And so, yeah, I kind of built up then uh, that kind of crystallized to me, yeah, this is the structure of it. And I think once I got that, it became, then it just becomes, a, or not, not just, but it just becomes a process of writing mm -hmm. what you've decided to, to write. Um, and I think I had sort of four key case study chapters, but yeah, I think that was, that was a, probably like the, mm -hmm. the, when you get the sort of, um, the dark, the darkest times is when you, when you, when that's trying to crystallize and also you realize the scale of it, you know, <laughs> because you sort of think, well, each chapter is going to take two or three months to do. And you, you sort of work all that out. Yeah. And it takes, it takes some kind of, um, yeah, a kind of like a drawing of breath mm -hmm. and things, but it's, um, it's good once you get going on that. So yeah, it's, in, it's, that's sort of how it works out in the humanities. Mm. Well, in my, in my case, I mean, some people come in knowing very exactly what they want to do and write, and they're probably just off they go writing a certain number of chapters per month, you know, mm. and off they go. But it wasn't really like that for me. But I think partly just because of the ambition, the ambition <laughs> up and the, you know, the diving in, um, you just, it just take it just takes a long time to come up with the structure. Mm. But I think that's something that I take forward now in, you know, my professional life is that often I do as a project manager, I am diving into something totally new, but I have a complete confidence that even at the beginning, it might seem overwhelming or, wow, this is something totally new. Like I, I know I can trust myself that in, uh, in a short while I can get on top of something, mm -hmm. shape it, and then bring it to a, through a series of steps to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that is one thing that, you know, a confidence that doing my PhD is, has given me because nothing can ever be as hard as that. No, and it's interesting <laughs> that you say that because definitely, and and you're talking about project management, uh, and and I've talked with other guests, and they they've told me one of the natural things the PhDs are able to do well is project management. And but the way I formulated, uh, I formulated often really resembles what you just said, which is where once you come out of a PhD. You don't. You you're not daunted by uh, something that may seem like you said. Oh my gosh, I don't know anything about this project or this domain or this specific question. You're not daunted by that. You know that. Okay, I'm going to sit with it for X time. I'm going to read. I'm going to dig. I'm going to start making write writing or whatever you do to kind of uh, organize your ideas. And then I'm going to come out of it not not being a full specialist, but you know having a good grasp of it and being able to deliver the, the the final result of this project and this is something you learn after you do the phd oh i may i'm capable of doing this i'm capable of doing a three-year project and coming out you know for starting from scratch completely and then coming out uh, having created something of value uh that and and that that was not known before so uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because i i believe it uh, uh completely yeah good yeah <laughs> uh, so now just a question. Were you able at this time, uh, so let's say, you know, year two, two to three, to keep your, the social, you know, the, the social aspect of your life in New York going and being in, in the Graduate Student Association, were you able to keep that going? Or did things get, uh, get more, more uh, too intense, uh, more towards the end? No, I always uh, kept all that stuff going. And I think, um, you know, I always treated my PhD just like a, like a job, like a okay. nine to five job, you know, and I, other people maybe they uh, come in a bit later and work later or do some things on weekends, but I always treated it as like, yeah, I'll be at work nine to five, mm -hmm. you know, I'll go home, switch off, do something else. And yeah, we'd be very sort of disciplined and not, not doing things, not work on the weekends either, but I've always tried to compartmentalize the academic work with, you know, with the, with, 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 with my social life and my family and that type of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, I was able to keep that going. I think it was really not till the last month in the, in the final month, I made. I just said, right, this last month, I'm going to work. And what I did is, uh, same for my, uh, uh, for my wife, and I'm very grateful to her. But uh, yeah, I just literally every day, I just worked all day, even after my dinner. I went back to the university, worked till ten o'clock, and yeah. I did that every day, and did it all every weekend oh for my, about okay. four or five weeks. And it was the, it was the only way of like just 
getting it over the fin- over the finishing line. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that was the only time when I really abandoned that very methodical um, way of working. But I think it was it, it was what was needed to get it over the line. Really, it's very good, and I think it's very healthy. Uh, and and it's it's not easy to to for everyone to do that. Depending also on the domain they're working uh, they're working in. Mm. But uh, I think it's very healthy to keep a space and keep a keep a portion of the, the, your week that is you know that that work doesn't seep into there i think it's a very good thing but it's true that at the end you need you have corrections you have uh, different things you need to do you have the thesis you need to turn in and you have to prepare for your defense it's very intense and and for sure at that moment if if you can and you, if you have like you say someone beside you that can that supports you you know you have to put all the hours that you can that you can into there uh we're almost getting to the end of part one but um so you you, you did a postdoc after your your phd uh how how you know uh, i don't i don't remember i i, I was looking at it i don't remember where, where you did it but i just wanted to know how was uh, because again in your domain i have no idea how that you know how, how how that's negotiated how that's navigated how did you get then from your phd in, in new york into your postdoc yeah so um well there's you can same ways in the sciences, I guess you can you can bid for research funding money, okay. uh, and so that was what I did. I entered a, a national competition uh, for you know where you submit a proposal on something that you want to research, and um, yeah, I was I think there was only about seventeen of these grants were awarded in that year, and so okay. um, from the the British the British Academy as it was then, um, they were the sort of awarding body. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's there's a you know and it's probably only about one in ten of people. Uh, get them but um yeah you just have to come up with a proposal and um have referees and people who would you know support you and submit examples of your work and so it's quite competitive but yeah it was i was delighted to um to get that and it meant i could carry on at york and uh everything was um you know i had that co- had that continuity and i guess i do mm-hmm. look back and think i could have i could have gone somewhere else you know maybe oxford or cambridge or somewhere like that but um yeah it, at the time that made sense to have that um have that continuity and, and continue some of the work that I was, well, it was a, it was a different subject, but it was, okay. it was really looking at, um, at time itself, actually medieval conceptions of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of related to the festivity stuff I'd been doing before. Mm. Um, but really looking, looking at, uh, you know, the introduction of clocks and clock, uh, oh. ways of thinking about time in relation to clocks. <laughs> Cause pretty obviously people didn't have clocks before. So didn't think about, uh, that sort of thing. So that was that was what I was really looking at, and it was really it was very relevant because we were coming up to the millennium as well. Mm-hmm. So as we were approaching the millennium, whether you, whether, whether you remember at the time, but like the whole thing about time and everything was really becoming a big mm-hmm. thing. So I kind of thought this would seem like a good topical thing, even though it's medieval, to be kind of researching, um, you know, because it has a kind of public applicability. So <laughs> um, yeah, Y two K, Y two K, and all of those things, the the, the clocks mm-hmm. uh, within the computers. Yeah, Yeah. No, that, I, that was yeah. It, there was a lot of <laughs> ink that uh, that flowed around that. Uh, no, super interesting. And so, uh, after all, after two years, uh, maybe a little bit more than two years of postdoc, then there was the next chapter. And and that this was not in the academic uh, domain, right? That's it. Yeah, I mean, during the course of my postdoc, I had, I applied for you know quite a number of. Uh, lectureships at um, at UK universities, and I was actually interviewed in five different universities for uh, lecture, uh, being a lecturer yep. in, in the English department. Um, but every time, yeah, when I was on the shortlist in the interview, I didn't get the job. Uh, and so it was really in yeah, my third year of my postdoc, in about April time, when I'd had my fifth sort of rejection, I kind of really thought, well, this is the choice now between <clears throat> when my postdoc funding ends, I can stick around, teach part time, and you know, try and hope that a job comes up mm-hmm. or, you know, I can basically go and do something else. And cause I had a, I was married, had, had a young daughter, mm-hmm. you know, and also my own personal ambition and sense of self, you know, I wasn't, it didn't feel right for, to just have this stick around, hang in there for how long. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of decided, yeah, I'm going to uh, have a plan to see if I can get a job outside of academia. Uh, so 
and uh, and the rest is the rest is history. Yeah, and and uh, we're going to talk about it in part two. We're gonna take we're gonna stop here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really curious to to hear about what came after and how all the experience you gained during your your PhD, your postdoc. Uh, how did how you put it to use uh, and uh, in your in the activities and in the project that you uh, embarked on after on uh, later on so we're taking a little pause and then we'll resume for for the for part two of our interview there we go so part one is done super interesting it's it's interesting the the, the clocks the, you don't think you take these things for granted now right and yeah <laughs> like there were no clocks and uh yeah it was what's uh, sun up sun down and uh, uh the rooster uh, <laughs> singing yeah like well you know the sun up but the, the amount the hours were divided according to the amount of daylight or night <laughs> so hours were called variable variable hours so an hour would be of of a, of a length longer or shorter depending whether it's winter or, or summer and super interesting so for, for, for clocks to come along and actually each hour was of the same length yeah it, it's just for us it's so natural yeah but for those guys <laughs> it's like whoa you know and it's that's what really intrigued me this that and it's, it's really the um people in towns took that up as 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 part of their identity mm -hmm. you know that these this was this is this was our clock this is how we're going to measure time <laughs> and you can just see that emergence of a of a sense of um, you know civic identity yeah. as towns got clocks they were distinguished from the monasteries and the okay. cathedrals that all rang these other types of time so it was, <laughs> it's time and identity really yeah it must have had different impacts like uh, even uh, employers now could think about, about time you know and about work and the time for the workers at a different in a different way and uh, it, must, it must have it's funny as you, you said it was the, I don't know I had never heard about anyone talking about the appearance of or the widespread appearance of clocks as a, a, a culture change in, in history but it makes so much sense <laughs> yeah yeah so we were at the stage where chris uh was now considering after his postdoc uh and and after the the his uh, after applying to some lecturing positions and not having them materialize thinking okay what am I going to do? And, and looking at the non-academic landscape and, and seeing where he was going to fit. How did you go about that? Were there peers around you who were also having that reflection? Uh, how was that process? How easy was that process or not easy? Uh, how was that, that uh, exploration, let's say? Yeah, it was kind of mixed because I think on the one hand, as I kept getting kind of rejections from the academic jobs. I kind of got a feeling of um, mm -hmm. like a feeling of running out of time or this is, this isn't going well, you know, and uh, if only I could just get that academic job, yeah. everything would be okay. So there was a kind of like a, a downside to it. But on the other hand, you know, I was really excited by other things that I was seeing around me, like, like the, like the internet was something that was just really taking off in the late nineties. And I was just fascinated by the internet and this whole, um, I mean, I, I, I say dem democratic <laughs> dissemination of information, which is not a very, not a very, uh, doesn't need to trip off the tongue easily, but just the, the way that to get access to information or study or learning that, you know, typically you have to go to a university, it can be quite elitist or privileged or, and cost a lot of money and time. But I was just like the idea that, um, that, that anybody could just access any type of information like videos and things as well that was coming along at the time and could learn anything. Um, you mm -hmm. know, if they had the right internet connection, it just, it just so, it sort of changed my view of the world and so excited me that as a, as a sort of educator and as a scholar, this, this potential. And I was just really infused by that and, and could see the sort of trans transformative potential of it. And so that's when I kind of thought, well, this could be an area where I could, you know, I would really be happy and excited to work in. And then I had to try and figure out, well, how do I <laughs> yeah. get to that from medieval studies, which is kind of like the opposite, uh, of this new of this mm -hmm. new techy technological thing, um, but then I figured out that actually, the, um, you know, there was this whole area of e learning and web based training where people were taking courses that were traditionally delivered, um, you know, in the classroom yeah. or even on a CD, you know, and actually were making it deliverable over the web. And I just thought that is, you know, that is what I, that's what I'm going to do. And so I really had a look. I ha had a search for jobs, you know, and companies. Um, I kind of looked at all their e-learning companies and read all their white papers and things 
And then I just started looking for Googling jobs, you know, e-learning jobs, web-based training. And mm-hmm. I saw that there were these jobs out there and didn't necessarily know how to do them. But I felt confident that if I applied for that job, mm-hmm. I reckon I could I could do that. And so that was my plan B, really, that yeah, if this academic stuff didn't work out, then come at the end of my funding, I was mm-hmm. going to, this is what I and, was going uh, to do. So, so again, were, were peers around you also having the same questions or were you... You, were you on your own in this uh, in this exploration, in this career exploration, this new domain? Yeah, I think most of my peers were they were get it. They were applying for mm. academic jobs and getting academic jobs. So I think that was one of the one of the challenges. Although some uh, maybe well, because there was there weren't there weren't there weren't lots of us. You know, there were yeah. there's only there's only sort of like a dozen or so people. So actually, um, maybe but for some of the years below. Um, you know, they were people were interested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to join the civil service. You know, they weren't going to go on to be academics. They were going to go and join government, uh, join the government, or maybe they were more interested in administrative mm-hmm. positions in universities. Um, you know, like um, you know, like alumni association, publicity uh, officer, or te- or on the tech okay, okay. tech side, like computing and that type of thing. So, yeah, I think some people were kind of. There was a kind of broad, broad mix. I didn't. It was. I wasn't alone that, that, or unique. You know, you're in that talking respect. about googling, and at, at that no, today we have it on on our phones. You know, but at that time it, it was not as, uh, uh, you, you know, it was not as widespread, and uh, it was the experience was not the same as it was today. But um, my question is, how how was it to? try and contact because you imagine i imagine eventually you had to contact people you had to well apply for positions but how easy was it and how did you go about uh you know getting to the interview that or the interviews that led you to your first job after your postdoc yeah i think um i think i did apply for a couple of jobs that were in universities at first because that seemed to be a good a good fit and then um yeah i was looking at these kind of private companies as well and um yeah i can't i'm trying to think i think it was Mon- something like Mon- yeah. uh, monster.co.uk yeah, yeah, yeah. like the job job board as it was and i think that's where i saw this job in this e-learning okay. company down in the southeast of england mm-hmm. so so a long way away from where i lived um yeah just an e-learning s- startup company and i just um yeah i sent through my cv to them um and yeah got a got a response back oh, wow. yeah come down come down for an interview so um yeah, I just the thing is, I never, I never actually did any of the things <laughs> I advise people to do, like, like networking or all this type of yeah. stuff. You know, informational interviews, all the things I tell people to do. I actually did not any of that. Mm-hmm. I did, I did the research into the industry. I did that, but I had no network. I had no, and so, but I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know then that that's what you needed to do. So I was just, you know, kind of um, going, you know, just kind of. Yeah discovering so that, as i went so, uh, this interview yeah. did it lead to your first position what did you get it at that time okay yeah so i went for my first interview i went all the way down to um to um yeah the southeast of england just outside london and had an interview and uh with the with the sort of guy who was going to be my manager and after you know about 20 minutes of talking he said oh well, let's just invite the chief executive in now and so they they came in and then they just said yeah we just want to um yeah we want to <laughs> offer you the job you know and it's just wow uh considering i didn't know how to do it um you know but they were they were an, they were a startup mm-hmm. so they had a lot of techie kind of people who could build software that would deliver a course but they didn't have anybody okay. very much educational who, could, and- who knew okay. how to structure information for learners yeah and so they were just you know they were keen to um you know they were keen to sign sign me up and um you know we talked about salary and that type of thing and then yeah i basically had to um yeah just call my wife and We're say yeah, I was, you know this is <laughs> this is a great opportunity we would we, we you know and the proposal would be we would wow. move down to the southeast of england so it was it was a yeah it was a quite a big change for us but it was for me i was just so excited because i didn't want to finish my postdoc funding and be st- and, and it's, it's, it does seem a very negative view mm-hmm. but like stuck in stuck in york teaching part-time yeah, yeah. waiting for something to come up and i just I didn't want that to happen and I really, and you know, and I was just so relieved as well to have yeah. something positive and, and energizing, yeah, something you know, modern, kind of a real opportunity. Uh, and they were trusting you to, to fill, to fill this position. And, uh, and I guess you, you dove into it and you learned whatever you need to learn. Uh, I imagine with, you know, in a hands-on approach too, with the team around you, but, um, 
the, the question I have is, so what were you bringing to the table, uh, you know, apart from you had been in academia for a while and, and so teaching, learning was something that, that you, you had bathed in for a, a, a long time, but specifically given, given that this, this was now kind of a software, it was a software uh, startup, uh, how, you know, what do you think uh, in, in the interview was the thing that they, um, that they, uh, they looked at you and said, okay, this is, this is the guy who's going to fill this position? the the best the best thing i did was um i kind of did a pitch a bit of a pitch at them and i said you know it's quite funny when i say this now because it's so we do this every day but i said like my vision is that um one day you know like uh mm. if if you've got a problem with the spark plugs on your car you know um you will be able to get your phone or mm -hmm. a computer, you'll be able to watch a video about how to change the spark plugs and then you'll go to the shop, buy them, and then you'll do, uh, lift the bonnet up and you'll, you'll do that yourself. And, you know, this, mm -hmm. the internet makes it possible for people to learn and do things themselves. And uh, they, they thought that was brilliant. They just, they absolutely love that. And it's so funny when I tell the story now, because <laughs> like, that's what my kids do. Like, isn't that what everyone does? You know, but in, in you know, in that time, It, that's that was that was and I, i don't mean to sound like i'm bragging or boasting or anything saying like hey i'm the i'm the visionary or something but that just when mm -hmm. i when i looked ahead at a logical extension of what was happening i saw that potential but what i was trying to do was mm -hmm. to see it from the customer's point of view and i think that's the the thing what they didn't want to do is just like hire some theory educational theory guy who can't relate to the end user or the customer and i think what the sort of vision that i set out for them was like here's an end user and here's what they'll buy or here's what they're going to do with what you're making. And I think that's something that really helped them know that mm -hmm. I was kind of, you know, a customer centric person to use the kind mm -hmm. of what the jar the jargon or what we look for in business. You know, we look for people who come from the customer's point of view. So I think it was good. It was, and I'd had no, I had no, I didn't deliberately do that. Mm -hmm. I just kind of tried to be as transparent and passionate as possible about what the potential for this yeah, technology so, was uh, showing um, some but creativity I think that was what made the difference showing that <laughs> yeah because uh, i don't know how much you had you, you told me that you had you know studied the the, the industry and, and and really looked into what was out there but it also showed that you kind of knew what their mission was and and in, and then projected it into the future for sure uh, that was that must have made a, a, an impression and, and they and they hired you um uh, I, i really want to later on given all your experience talk about you know your experience talking to students and and, and uh and giving them advice even though you said that at the time you didn't follow the, the advice that you're giving out but maybe maybe later on in the, in the in the interview but i'm still interested in knowing um because This is very different from from what you were setting out to do while you were applying for lecture for uh, uh, lecturer positions, right? Hmm. You must have had uh, well, not not you must uh, maybe I shouldn't say you must have had, but was there some some sort of uh, like mourning for your academic career that you had to go through? The morning process uh, of saying, "Okay, well, I I went all as far as I could. This is not uh, materializing, and and uh, I'm going to turn a page." Uh, was that an easy process to you, or was it was there some some little pain there from from uh, kind of leaving academia? How how was how was that? And and I imagine that once you got this position, you kind of probably forgot about all of that, and you were excited about this new thing. But still, that this this transition and uh, this this because you were also there's a community that kind of you're kind of leaving and eventually you were even moving from from the the the, the city you were mm. for a while. Yeah, I think it's um, it's interesting because I think I was so excited and energized by this new opportunity that that just kind of like carried carried me through a lot of the stuff um, mm -hmm. because. Mm -hmm. You can, as you can imagine, you know, in that final year of my postdoc, there was a lot of pressure on this whole thing about what are you going to do next. A lot of weight of expectation mm -hmm. and responsibility as a, as a as a father and as a as a as a, as yeah. a husband, yeah. you know. And um, 
yeah, put, put, put up on myself by myself. But nonetheless, it, it was it kind of weighed quite heavy on me, I guess. And then, yeah, I was really energized by this new opportunity. So I think I think I always had the ambition in academia to go as far as I can. And I think that's when I look back on it. That was my ambition. I'm going to go as far mm-hmm. as I can. And actually, when I look back on it, I did I did go as far as I could, <laughs> you know, and it, it mm-hmm. wasn't it, I didn't if I look back, I didn't have the aspiration to be a professor, like from day one, if you know what I mean. I, I saw mm-hmm. it as a a, a, trans, a fantastic opportunity to do a PhD funded and to do a postdoc funded and people to give me money, to, you know, for me to produce research, high quality research, yep. you know, and, and so it was an opportunity. I, I don't know. I don't, so I don't kind of mourn for like, I never wish I could have been a lecturer, if you know what I mean. I, I was okay, I was okay. great. I was grateful for the opportunity. I had a fantastic experience. Um, there were some troubles at, near the end because it was, but it wasn't so much, you know. And um, I think I also I published my thesis as a book, and so I kind of felt like okay. you know everything. I kind of wrapped it up, and it was a neat package, really. And I could leave that, you know, that was the book. And now I'm going to go on to do another mm. chapter of my life. And yeah, I think it was perhaps just a little bit maybe dealing with other people's expectations. Sometimes I went to a couple of conferences after I left academia. I still carried on to going to some conferences and would go and see people and they would sort of say, oh, uh, I'm sure something will turn up, Chris. And they were trying to be kind of um, sympathetic. And it was it was (laughs) kind of a little bit of jarring because it was kind of like, well, no, you know, things are good for me. So it was there was some of those sort of things to deal with, really. And it was other people's expectations, (laughs) maybe as much as as much as anything. Um, Hmm. Yeah, you kind of touched on the the point where I wanted to get, which is uh, I I I feel and interacting with with people out there that there's a, there's a lot of this mm-hmm. idea that if you leave academia, you're failing somehow, and you're not. You're you're just changing another. You're changing paths, and you you're going to bring with you uh, uh, your quiver full of. Uh, different, you know, different uh, skills and uh, and uh, abilities that you're going to use somewhere else uh, in something mm-hmm. else, and they're going to excel at. Uh, but that was my point. So my where I was going, wanted to get is well, there, there can be uh, and myself, you know, when, when you there's an institute, there's people, there's a community that you kind of go away from. There's there's always a little bit of maybe sadness there. But professionally and in terms of the big picture of your of your life, you you just you know you're just pivoting and doing something else. It's not uh, people shouldn't be afraid of uh, of whatever's outside academia. There's a lot of things out there, exciting, stimulating, and and fulfilling. Yeah, no, I think that's exa- exactly right because it's 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 easy to stick with what you know, um, but when you look at it, you you can't stay in it forever because you need you need you need to, you need to you need money to live and you need yeah. you know and you need a direction and a purpose and you need to feel fulfilled and that's the risk that people hang hang around in in an academic environment because that's that's where I just re, you know really want to help people especially if they yeah. you know adjuncting or doing something where they're very low paid but they kind of feel that's all that they can do and it and it, and it isn't but it's um, yeah so it's it's interesting it's a mix of, it's a, it's a sort of a mix of emotions and I think. It probably it took a long time. I didn't have a a lot to do. Probably for nearly ten years, I didn't have a lot to do with academia. After mm-hmm. I left, I gradually sort of wound things down, and then I was. But I was in, embracing this whole new world of um, in business and mm-hmm. project management and sustainability. So I had a lot of other exciting things and passions, and I didn't really sort mm-hmm. of mourn what I'd left behind because I was really st- stimulated by what I was doing next. Yeah, and you were growing on on you know you were growing this all, whole other side of of uh, of a few of your abilities and and of your no for sure. So you you just mentioned project management, sustainability. So how how did that before we talk? Because I I really want to talk about uh, things to do with with you know finding a career after your PhD and based of, on all the experience you have. But still on your journey, how was this uh, transition into? project management and now sustainability how did you navigate that and also what uh do you think that from your phd in terms of skills uh what do you think allowed you to to go into these domains 
Yeah, I mean, it was a kind of um, accidental in that I was working at the e-learning company for probably about two and two and a part years, and then one day the um, my boss uh, came in, and every day he would normally just say, uh, "Oh, good morning, Chris," and I say, "Oh, good morning, Nigel," mm -hmm. and then he said, uh, "Actually, Chris, it's not a good day today because the venture capitalists who are funding us have." withdrawn their funding they're not going to fund us anymore so oh. you you've lost your job today now oh my this is it we're <laughs> going to have to close the company um so that that's it and so it was quite a shock and a blow to me of mm. having kind of a um you know made this jump and relocated my family and everything like that um yeah just to actually lose my job and not even have any note you know like a notice period where you'd be paid literally mm. I didn't get paid for that month's work even, so I had to... It was immediate. Uh, it was immediate. I just had to ring my mm. wife and say, yeah, I'm just lost my job. There's not even, Because the company's gone bust, there's no... Yeah. Uh, normally, if you get made redundant, you get a notice period or a, mm -hmm. or a payoff or something like that. But yeah, we didn't even get paid for that month's work. So it was quite, it was quite a blow um, uh, and a thing to, to happen. And But, you know, I kind of... This is what I always say to people is that the resourcefulness of repurposing myself to get a career outside academia it's kind of like okay i already did this once and yeah. <laughs> it can't be it can't be as bad, it can't be as bad as that because i've got experience but then i was a bit like well how much experience have i really got um the other thing also that we were moving we were moving house because we decided to relocate to the southwest of england so mm -hmm. a complicating factor was that we were actually moving um as well uh, so that didn't help, but, um, yeah, just through sort of talking to some people and actually it was a connection of my dad. He, who knew a consultant and he knew, he knew, um, a managing director of a company that might have a possibility. Um, yeah. So I, um, sent in my CV to them and they had a vacancy for, uh, somebody to, um, a trainer and a technical author. And so that okay. quite fitted in quite well with the sort of e-learning stuff and the, mm -hmm. and the sort of teaching and training background and the writing so yeah i got a job with them working on um uh it's well you probably know you've probably seen them but it's like you know at um on on bus stops you have a a sign that tells you it counts down when's the bus going to come yes. like in five minutes in three minutes the bus is due yep. Yep. so it was a company that made that software so the bus talks to the bus stop and yeah that was who i got okay. a job with uh, i didn't know anything about this stuff but uh I would end up going into bus stations to train bus drivers and write <laughs> manuals and this type of stuff. So yeah, it was a good, it was a good sort of um, first step for me to get another job, um, mm. but then sort of start to re start to rebuild my career. Okay, Th this makes me think of, of something that I also mention often, which is g give yourself the chance to, or don't try to, or don't aim to find the dream job right away. Uh, mm -hmm. give, give yourself a chance to go with what works at the moment, or the best if possible, in, in whatever's in your horizon, and then you'll build up experience, and eventually, next time you change, then you're going to kind of level up to something that's closer to maybe what your dream, dream job is. So here, you were in domain that had that was really you know far departed from whatever you you had done before and uh, <laughs> and uh, very different in the interactions you were having and even in the mission let's say of and and you went and i imagine that you you gained with that experience Yeah, because I'd, I'd been there for a short time and then they, um, the, the managing director asked me to do a little research project and make a kind mm. of recommendation about how they should uh, structure the business because part of the, part of the business was taking a lot of uh, data mm -hmm. about yeah. public transport, <laughs> uh, like you know buses and trains and crunching it all together so that it could then be used on websites where people could go in and search. I mean, we're so used to doing it now. It's on our phones, but this is in the... Oh, early my. part of 2000 <laughs> yeah people would actually ring up a call center and say yeah i'm in uh, this town i want to go to that town can you work out a journey for me by a bus <laughs> so and then they would put it into some software and then tell them the journey mm -hmm. and the times and it, it just you know my, when i tell my kids they just it's like it blows their mind you know who would ever ring up someone and ask for this information but okay. this is what this is what we did yeah in the early part of 2000 so we were really this company had mm -hmm. some contracts to gather this information up for about 
probably for oh, nearly wow. half of the UK actually, and put it into these different regional and national websites. And so I actually made a recommendation about how this could be structured. And then the manager, managing director said, do you want to run it then and be the manager of this department? So oh God, I couldn't really say no. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I had two people working for me and, and a whole load of computers. Oh, wow. And we had to Amazing. send out CDs every week to these different call centers, you know, but it, it was good. It was, yeah, CDs you had to burn CDs and put, put them in the post. <laughs> It's it's so funny when you, when you look back, but it's it was you know I'd, mm. I'd never done that, but it was just the confidence of like yeah I can see I can see how mm. this could be done, and uh, as long as you can you have the confidence yeah. in your own ability, and you can also yeah. assure other people that you're going to do give it your best shot and keep communicating with them, and if things go wrong, be honest and ask for help. You know, as long as you have that attitude, I think that you're always going to get supported. So that was my real sort of. Luck land on my feet. I actually kind of, you know, um, got a man- got a management position within a within a, a software company, and quite a, a, d- a decent amount of responsibility. Did you hear that? With all the abilities and skills you've developed so far, a lot of what ends up differentiating you and pushing you forward in terms of your career has to do with the attitude with which you face challenges you're presented with. His self confidence, honesty, and open communication were key for Chris in advancing into a managerial position of more responsibility at this stage. In the second part of our conversation, Chris then went on to talk a little bit more about this idea of starting lower in an organization to then climb the rungs faster as a PhD once you've shown your colors and taken on a few challenging projects. Yeah. No, and and again, another interesting thing is once you get into a position that's maybe uh, lower than you expected, if you if you you know prove your capacity and you get involved on projects that are maybe a little bit on the side of of what your job description is you're going to be noticed and you can evolve within the company it's also it's also uh, something that that you know you don't know when you're coming out of a phd or a postdoc that that businesses work like this you you can evolve you can uh, grow within an organization yeah, I think that's a really that's a really good point, David. Because within academia, it doesn't it's it's a very sort of mm-hmm. linear, hierarchical, slow progression. Um, but actually, in companies and organisations, you know, they they especially if they're small, they're quite flat. And if you're sometimes you have to go lower to go yeah. higher. That's one of the things I say. You know, it might feel like oh, it's a bit of a step down because I had this really prestigious research fellowship at this mm-hmm. top university, and now. What, you know, what am I doing working for this uh, software company out in the middle of no- out in the middle <laughs> of nowhere? You know, uh, but actually, once yeah, you you take the plunge, you learn, you absorb, and then you get recognised within the company, and then that's the next step for me. Is actually, I after after um, a couple of years, I really realised that the knowledge I had was quite extremely valuable, and um, that's when I was starting to look for a job as a consultant because okay. I realised I could I could you know. Um, I could earn quite a lot yeah. more money um, and also have some new challenges by just but if somebody else hired me out to, as a consultant. So that re- was really my next step to get hired as a as a transport consultant. Mm-hmm. Um, so that yeah, that's what I did next. Mm-hmm. And so then then eventually um, you you went also into project management uh, uh, and. Well, and this even in in the the bank you're working in today, that's how you started, right? Did you go get training for project management, or did things did you organically through your experience grow towards uh, towards those positions? Yeah, it was just, it was organic, really, and also a, a little bit of a sense of uh, arrogance <laughs> that I could do it better than the other people. Uh, you know, when I worked for that software company, and then we we took on new contracts, um, and people had to manage. You know, um, oh, now we've got to give this data to the this part of the government or something like that. And just looking at it and seeing how other people were doing it, and just thinking, you know, I could, I could do this. It's not my job, but I could do this better. I could do it more structured. I would talk to the stakeholders better and run it better. And I just and so then I gradually, yeah, I took on some responsibilities. And then when I joined the consultancy, I was actually a project manager for hire type of thing. So then the that consultancy hired me out to. Um, work on projects, mainly European uh, Commission okay. funded transport projects. Um, so yeah, that's when I was I was a, for three years I was the project manager of a um, research project into congestion mm-hmm. charging, 
benefits? What's the benefits of introducing congestion charging okay. in cities? How much does it reduce congestion, pollution? Oh, what wow. can you do with the money? And I, I ran a big research project on that, which was, it was good because it, it, it was my research background, but it was also, I was hired out by the company to the, to the European Commission to manage that project. So and it was good. I had a lot of international mm-hmm. travel. Um, but yeah, I didn't have any training in it. It was just, to me, it just um, sort of comes naturally. I think it also from the PhD of just like going from something that's an idea to a methodology, to a plan, mm. to the delivery of the plan, to the conclusion and the mm. handover of that thing to the customer or the end user. It just, that's what a PhD is or writing an article or something. Yeah, it's, it's just, and that's one of... Intuitive, yeah, and that's one of the big uh, transferable skills or transferable set of skills. What you just said, one of the big transferable set of skills that PhDs maybe are not conscious that they that they come with after their PhD, but that they do have and that they can that they can use in whichever industry they desire. Because uh, and uh, again, often you'll have to prove yourself to the organization because uh, pe- you know people won't right away put you, put you in a management position co- you know coming out of academia in, and for many reasons because you haven't proven yourself in the, in mm. the industry but quickly a phd can get into a, a lower position start proving proving himself or herself and eventually access these these uh, manage these project management uh, positions of high responsibility because they have the capacity to analyze, crunch data, uh, vi- you know, uh, put build projects from scratch, and then deliver. Uh, and and I think it's uh, it's something that uh, listeners out there that that are cons- that are thinking: Am I employable after my PhD? Yes, you are. <laughs> you definitely. <laughs> yeah, you you, de- you definitely are. Yeah, project and project management is it's such a massive growth industry i mean i never yeah when i was at school at university i never really knew much about it but you know change isn't a kind of cliche about change is the only constant <laughs> now but when you look at the rate of change the pace of change in our society mm. and who is who is the pe- who is the who are the people managing those changes they're, they're project managers and it could be like the you know it could be the olympics <laughs> yeah, or it could yeah, be a anything. election campaign or it could be the upgrade on your phone every time something changes or is a big event or something project managers have to sit down with a blank sheet of paper and work it all out. And it's, it's, it's really exciting to me to feel part of that, that community uh, of, of project managers and see, yeah, I guess eventually that's how my professional mm-hmm. identity is solidified. Whereas it was originally sort of like a researcher or maybe, you know, a kind of um, mm. education and learning specialist within tech companies. But yeah, really my, my, um, my, my, my professional identity is solidified around a project manager or even now we're called sort of change managers because change managers. it's becoming less the case that change managers. Yeah. Because it's less the case that there's a distinction between like run, run the bank, mm. change the bank, as you can talk about with banks, you know, so in the old days, banks mainly ran the bank, you know, most of the banking was the same. And then maybe some little department introduced some new mm. thing every so often, you know, but, but now the, run i'm not it's, it's still an important part of what banks do obviously running day-to-day operations but there's yeah. there's so much change happening all the time you know you think about <laughs> banking on your phone uh and all these sorts of services that check that the the, the the change the bank function mm. has become much bigger you know, it's not an occasional thing that happens it's every constant, so often yeah, but it's yeah, a constant yeah. all the time you know and you, you 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 can't stop like we think about your phone you can you can't you can't stop having updates Oh, I wish my phone would just stand no. still. You know, <laughs> well, it it doesn't. It's it keeps cha- it keeps changing, and that's really what's exciting to me is when is 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 when ch- is how do you manage continuous ch- how do you manage mm. continuous change? Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's interesting and it's it's true. You you, we, you notice it on on your phone. Banking is is definitely one of them, and now that, I imagine with cryptocurrencies getting more and more importance. I I anyway, I don't think we're going to go into that, but. Uh, I find it very interesting from what from what you said that you use the term solidify my my professional identity solidified around this uh, this activity that I developed but uh, it what, what, one thing I th- I find interest, interesting is don't be afraid of uh, not knowing what you're going to become when you when you, when you leave uh, mm-hmm. because that's going to materialize with time uh, and uh, again because you 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 probably won't you, you, you may be lucky and have very good networking and start right away with a job that you adore and that you're going to stick stick for with life but it's not you know it's not a, a given 
so I think that's that's a very very interesting interesting thing, and it, it goes with what I said before: of give yourself the time to slowly get to where you want to get, right? Um, but yeah. One one thing, uh, and we're reaching the end of. The, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed that uh, we're we're uh, my time is almost ending for this this uh, for the interview. But so, uh, w- uh, along with all of this, at a certain point, uh, you decided in 2012 to start something to give back to the community you had come from in a way the the uh, the students, mm-hmm. the PhD students, the master students, which is Jobs on Toast, and. You know, you've spent all these years kind of with the same mission that I I have kind of taken for myself of helping people out there who are doing their masters, who are doing their PhD or postdoc, and who are in doubt about what is my future, what's my professional future. Uh, let's. I'd just like you to talk a couple of minutes uh, uh, about jobs on toast, about what your experience has been. Maybe changes you've seen in the in the in the late in you know the latest years because things are changing, uh, and uh, and uh, maybe finish yeah. by sharing two or three pieces of of advice for people out there who may be anxious about not really knowing what their professional future will look like if or when they they end up uh, leaving academia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Um... It's interesting. The jobs on toast kind of came about like yeah, it's quite in a, quite a serendipitous way. Um, uh, I was invited by my old dissertation supervisor to go up to York in two thousand and nine to give a a little um, seminar on the on the topic. I was invited was like how um, how to market okay. yourself for careers outside of academia. And um, uh, Jeremy asked me to go up and could you just like talk, you know talk on this subject for an hour or so? We'd be pleased to have you. Mm-hmm. And I'd never really thought about it. So yeah, I went to do that and gave that talk and. Um, you know, I was just really, it, without sort of blowing my own trumpet as such, the, the impact that it made on the people who were in that room and their change in their demeanor and how they spoke to me and they spoke afterwards was, it just, it just like, it just showed to me that there was a, there was a need that I'd never really thought of or identified that the, this information was really helpful beyond, you know, in the room. But so I just thought, well, how could this information get to a wider audience? Because really at that time, there was not anything else. Um, I think versatile PhD okay. may have been around. Um, and so, but then I really determined, well, how could I get this, some of this information, what I've just said out onto the internet, you know, if I could just make a website, disseminate it. Um, and, but also maybe um, go and do the same sort of talks at other universities. So that's when I, <laughs> it took me quite a long time because it took me till 2012 actually to kind yeah. of figure out blogging and, how to make a website and you know i was busy obviously with my, with my job and my family and everything so it, it, it was always a side project yeah but i launched that in 2012 and just really kind of built up tried to have an ambition of like once every two months writing something going and trying to give talks and then like reflecting on my experiences of that and writing about that so um yes yeah, so in the beginning it was really trying to find the way and it was linking up with some other people as well like uh, yeah. like jen polk um from from canada um, in the early days from PhD to life and just trying to find other people. Um, I was a hand call from cheeky scientists mm-hmm. who were sort of on the same kind of mission. And so, yeah, that sort of seemed like some of us in different countries. Um, but it was, but it was very, it was very early days, but, um, I mean, it's interesting now because I kind of feel like there's, there's lots of people who've all joined in from different mm-hmm. countries. Yeah. Like, like yourself, David, I just really, it's just really exciting to me that, um, what, what I started off or a couple of us started off is really grown into a bit more of a movement and also to see the impact on universities that it's not some afterthought you know really that hey maybe once a year we should think about talking to the PhDs about other careers but actually some universities are building it into their actual Mm. um, graduate training you know careers advice and careers outside of academia and that's what's exciting to me is that in 10 years you know we've actually built this into a yeah it it is uh, it, it is changing and um, some a lot of the the people you you, you mentioned are are still uh, there and, and helping a lot of people. Uh, the, I think things that have changed lately uh, in terms of uh, spreading the message are Twitter, uh, social media in general. 
uh, mm-hmm. podcasting uh, for sure is, is is something that that has brought a different uh, reach and uh, but but um, True, yeah what what I what I find interesting in, in the conversations I've had at universities is I feel that even universities now are you know are getting the message that that uh, they need to prepare their students for this reality of not everyone can become a professor and it's it's just simple as that not not everyone and mm-hmm. apart from not everyone just a small percentage of people have and i think uh, even, even now with uh, with all this the, the the problem with the covid and and with the pan- the pandemic the closing up of, of universities all of that is even getting more you know the access to those the positions is getting even more more difficult uh, at at this time Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, typically in the UK, something only like fifty percent of PhDs are still in academia three and a half years okay. after they graduate. And so, yeah, with a bit of a split of, uh, um, you know, some some people are obviously doing research work still as postdocs. Some people are doing teaching yeah. and lecturing, and you know, but probably half of all PhDs, um, and some some are in administrative positions. But yeah, all half of all PhDs will be working outside of academia. You know, when you tell that to especially like first and second year PhDs, they, <laughs> they can't believe it. It's like mind blowing, you is. know, and um, even, you know, even when I talk to people about people I meet and they, I introduce myself, say I've got a PhD or something and they say, what, what, why aren't you working at Oxford or Cambridge? You know, you've got a PhD that, that must be what you should have been doing. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting that this is powerful expectation, but yeah. it's trying to educate people really about, you know, th- I call it sometimes like career consciousness, developing a career consciousness mm-hmm. is beyond, just just who's around you but actually this wider this wider picture and yeah when you tell people the statistics i think that is that that that, that is a real you know a sort of eye opener to them um cuz the, the the important thing and i'm i'm you know busting the time but is this doesn't mean stop your phd and go do something else doing your phd is something that's going to that's going to add a lot of value to to your to you as a person uh, to you as a contributor to society later on, just don't, just just expect that it's not a given that you're going to to end up being a professor. But like you said, you can stay in the uh, alt alt they call it, right? The alternative academic mm-hmm. career paths that are that are out there. There's a lot of things you can do in and around the uh, university. But then the 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 the, the, uh, the job market out there needs it, it, sometimes the and I, it's funny i'd love i'd love to have your input on that maybe in another conversation uh, industry doesn't know they need phds but they do and when they interview these people they're like okay oh this is actually a very good candidate i'm gonna take them uh, i'm gonna yeah we're gonna, yeah i'm gonna take them in it, it is it is an interesting one because phds like we we need we need like a a branding agency or something yeah. to, <laughs> to, I totally to, agree. <laughs> and I think that's in some ways what I've been trying to do with jobs on toast really is a little bit is like, how do you, how do you rebrand the PhD for, to some, for something different, both to the people who are doing it and to people outside. And I think it's very hard. Cause it's very hard. How do you reach all employers? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of impossible, but I think, you know, we have done a good job and I see things in the media now, which I would never have seen, you know, about, um, about PhDs being kind of like multi-skilled, um, flexible mm-hmm. uh, knowledge workers who can kind of, like we were saying, you know, switch from project to project. Mm. What we, our capabilities very much fit the kind of the, the job market of today, I think. Mm. Um, as long as we can, we as PhDs can make that imaginative leap exactly. and as long as employers can also drop some of their prejudices yeah. uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely, the the I love imaginative leap because it, it's through you. Picture yourself in that position. Allow yourself to picture yourself in that position, and then go talk to the people. The things you said you didn't uh, you didn't do per se, but yeah. but uh, go go just find people around you who know someone who does that job that interests you. They'll be happy to, and and they you know especially if they have a PhD too, they'll be happy to take time to take coffee to uh, I don't know have lunch with you, share their story. And maybe point point you towards something that might interest you, Chris. Yeah, we really have reached the uh, the end of the of, of our time. Uh, if people want to uh, want to reach out to you, want to uh, you know see whatever you, you've been writing lately, how where can I reach you? Where can they reach you online? What's the best way to to be up to date with uh, with with what you've what you're up to? 
Yeah, well, the best place is to uh, go to jobsontoast.com. That's that's my uh, my website where I probably publish an article every every two months. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, you can also um, follow me on Twitter. So that's just uh, at Jobs on Toast. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, try and keep up. Uh, you know, putting out content on Twitter, both sharing my own content, but also sharing some of the best mm. uh, you know stuff uh, relating to PhD careers. Uh, as well so yeah they're, they're the places where you can uh, where you can find me excellent chris thank you so much for for having accepted to come to to the microphone and and chat with me uh i definitely i i would have talked uh, i think a full other hour <laughs> because uh, there's uh, we we you know there's so much to talk about uh who knows if we can if we can have a, another conversation maybe on a specific theme I, i i'd love to but thank you uh, uh i i it's really uh, an inspiring path that you uh, that, that you have uh, a, a, an inspiring journey that you've had and to me it's especially inspiring that um, you you take time uh, to apart from your professional life apart from your family life keep trying to bring this message to to people in graduate school out there that there's uh, a, uni- a, a whole universe of things out there that they can do after graduating and that they will be fulfilled at doing and and uh, you know intellectually stimulated and part of and, and you know a productive part of of uh, society and uh, i think that's uh, that's very uh, precious and it's very noble well thanks very much david i really enjoyed talking to you thanks for inviting me on hi again i hope you enjoyed this conversation and that you took at least one take-home message from it. If you did, make sure to subscribe on your podcast app and to share Papa PhD with your friends. I'm sure they are asking themselves the same questions and that they will enjoy it too. Before ending the episode, let me introduce you to two podcasts that you might also enjoy. Plants and Pipettes, a podcast about plants and about the research around them, and The Lonely Pipette. Hmm, sounds like we have a theme going this week a brand new podcast aiming to help scientists do better science. And roll the tape. Do you like plants? Like really, really like them? Do you wish you could get a glimpse at how they work on the inside, how they grow, flower, avoid problems like drought and heat, and how they defend themselves against attacks? Well, we do too. That's why we at Plants and Pipettes explore the fascinating inner workings of plant molecular biology in our podcast and on our blog. Did you know that bumblebees can control the flowering time of plants by gently biting on them? Or that soap bubbles are great for plant pollination? We are Tegan and Yoram, two plant scientists who escaped the lab to bring you the hot new research without all the scientific jargon. Plus, we talk about topics of diversity and equality in the academic system. And bring fun science facts from the last week. Oh, and we talk about cats. And sometimes also we rant. You can read our stuff on plantsandpipettes.com or search for Plants and Pipettes in your favorite podcast app. Plants and Pipettes, we, we talk, talk plant, plant science. science. <laughs> Are you working in research, trying to do the best science you can? Are you a team leader, a research assistant, postdoc, PhD student, or any other type of scientist? Are you looking for a place where you can sit, relax, and listen to inspiring people? Well, we have good news for you. You've just found what you're looking for. Hi, everybody. My name is Renaud Pourpre. And I am Jonathan Weitzman. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Lonely Pipette. Helping scientists do better science. And that's it for this first episode of Season 2. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll be taking some of the pearls of wisdom we shared with you on your journey. Thank you, and have a great week. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Papa PhD podcast. Head over to papaphd.com for show notes and for more food for thought about non-academic postgrad careers. I'll always be happy to share inspiring stories, new ideas, and useful resources here on the podcast. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to always keep up with the discussion and to hear from our latest guests.